Hi, I'm Alessia, and you're about to watch a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help you take your next step with God. If you'd like to learn more about Calvary, make sure to download our mobile app on the App Store or Google Play Store by searching up My Calvary. How's everybody doing? Hey, we're really glad that you're here. So I thought we could start by all recognizing something. So if I could just ask this, and that is anybody here, you've made at least one really bad decision in your life, at least one. All right, not like I was supposed to go left and I went right. I mean, like more, you know, life altering than that. We've all made at least one really bad decision. Okay, um, the, the other thing that I'm hoping we can recognize is this thing that we say, we say this all the time, that if I knew then what I know now, things would be different. So because all of us did that, maybe we could start on this side of the room and say, no, I won't do that. That would be the weirdest service ever. Um, but I will tell you this, just in the spirit of us kind of all recognizing it, uh, I want to tell you one of my mistakes. So let, let me show you this. Um, this is my original Star Wars laser disc. Now you say, what is a laser disc? You're about to find out. So uh, you'll see this here. This is the, yeah. Like, wow, I didn't even know that, that they were so, it's like a CD took like some magic pills. Um, so let me tell you how this works for a laser disc. So what you would do is, uh, now you got to understand the reason why this was so attractive, if you can imagine this was an attractive thing, was because uh, this was the, uh, a laser disc was the only way for you to actually get a true widescreen or back then they called it letterbox. Uh, now it's just called widescreen, but back then it was called letterbox. It wasn't like the square TV it was a four by three. This was the full theatrical uh, screen. So anyway, you would, do, you would put this in, get cozy. You'd watch the movie for about 30 minutes. Then the movie would stop and a turtle would appear. I'm not even joking. A turtle would appear and it would be on its shell and it would say, hey, I need you to flip me over. So you'd get up. Flip the disc. 30 more minutes. Turtle shows back up. Hey, flip the disc or grab a new disc. And then you'd take out the second disc and you would do, and you'd do the same thing. Uh, and depending on, you know, how long, you know, you'd be in real trouble if you were watching like Apocalypse Now or something really long. I'm guessing no reaction. Nobody saw that movie. Um, so anyway, uh, but what happens is, is that I remember the day that I went to go buy my Laserdisc player is I was on my way, I was with a buddy of mine, and uh, so we were on our way to Brandsmart. Now, once again, wanting to buy a Laserdisc player, that was mistake number one. Going to Brandsmart was mistake number two because that place has been, currently is, and will always be a complete disaster. And so here, and I always feel like I'm doing something wrong every time I go to Brandsmart. Because you go in there and you're like, hey, I want to buy this whatever. And they're like, oh, yeah, you got to talk to that guy. Then you talk to a guy. The guy pulls a random piece of paper and he's like, all right. And he gives you a number and he's like, I want you to go talk to my friend. You're going to pay them. I don't know why this person is apparently from the Bronx, but anyway, <laughs> we're going with it. So like, you're going to go talk to my friend. And then you pay the other person and then they give you this, you know, this receipt. And they're like, all right, we want you to go behind the building, round to the docks. Then you hand a no, the receipt to some other guy at this loading dock, and then they don't hand you like a bag or anything. They just hand you the merchandise, and they're like, now you get in your car and you get out of here as fast as you can. <laughs> like, this is how a drug deal goes down. And yet, this is apparently how you buy appliances. And so anyway, that's why I always feel. So nonetheless, I take my buddy with me, and he says to me, uh, right before we're going to buy this, now at the time, I'm... I'm not married yet, but I'm engaged. And I didn't tell my fiance, now my wife of 22 years, that I'm going to do this. Not telling her, mistake number three. And then I, I go, um, and my, my buddy, be right when we're in line to, to buy it, because using my powers of persuasion, I not only was going to buy a laser player, but I talked him into buying one too, because that's, that's what friends do. They, they pay it forward. And so anyway, so we're in line. And he says to me, he goes, are you sure you want to do this? Because I've just read that there was this new technology that they're coming out with where they're going to make movies the size, that they're going to come out the size of a, C, a regular CD. And my response was, really? 
And are you going to take your flying car to buy it when it comes out? And so, and, uh, so that, was, that was mistake number four. Six months later, to my, much to my surprise, DVDs were released. And I'm still, I'm still buying Frisbee-sized movies. Now, here's, now, this is the thing. And, and I've kept this for all these years. And I keep it within five feet of my desk. And no matter where we've officed or, 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 officed or where I've been, I've kept this within about five feet uh, from me. And, and listen, um, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea where my college degree is. Um, I know it's in a frame and I know it's in a box. I just have no idea where that box is. And uh, so, you know, whatever other accomplishments I've had, they're somewhere, but I don't know exactly where. And my, my thing is this, I don't need reminders of the good things I've done. I need reminders of the dumb things I've done. That's why I keep the laser disc close. Uh, because that is probably helping me more than just like, hey, look, you took a bunch of classes and finished. Um, then, but, but here's what happens for me, is that when I was in college, uh, I heard this saying, and it's really been one of those things that's uh, impacted me and shaped my life, I think. Um, but I heard the saying that we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. And so we spend our entire lives making decisions and you did that, you know, do I stay? Do I go? Do I buy that thing? Do I not buy that thing? Do I say yes? Do I say no? Uh, do, you know, and, and so what, what most of us recognize is that when we look back at bad decisions we've made, poor choices that we've made, is that if I knew then what I know now, then things would be different. And that's what wisdom does. It gives us the benefit of hindsight and it puts it on the front end of the decision, the front end of the circumstance, so we can make the best choice possible. Now, the beauty of wisdom is it allows us to make decisions uh, you know, th they don't have to be alone. And so uh, a lot of times we will make decisions emotionally or we'll make decisions based on kind of what everybody else is doing. And if you don't believe me, here's what I would, I'd encourage you to do this experiment in your neighborhood. Now, here's what I would want you to do. Now, this may take a few weeks, but I want you to do this little experiment, or maybe you recognize it, is that you will have uh, someone in your neighborhood is going to buy a new car. And what you're gonna find is that when someone in your neighborhood buys a new car, over the next few weeks, half of your neighborhood is gonna switch, trade out their car for, some, for something new. And it's just the weirdest thing that happens. I watch it happen in my neighborhood. I watch it happen in other people's neighborhood that somebody buys a new car and then the guy across the street is like, that idiot bought a new car? I mean, why is he driving a new car? Why can't I have a nicer car than him? I mean, should he really be driving a nicer car than me? And there's all these weird, you know, conversations that are having and then people are buying cars, next thing you know. And so, and so here's the thing, is that whether it's emotional or it's just kind of based on what everybody else is doing, but the good news is this, we're not alone. And, and even better than that is, is that if you're a Christian, God wants to give you wisdom, not just random wisdom, but he wants to give you his wisdom so that we can make the best decisions possible. And in fact, not only does he want to, God is hoping that you will ask him. Now, um, I want to read you this passage from the book of James. I'm reading to you in a moment. But you got to understand something about James. Now, this guy, uh, James, was the younger brother of Jesus. Now, if I can ask this question, how many of you have a brother? Could I ask that? Okay, very good. Most of you. Now, what would it take? for you to believe that your brother was the Messiah. I'm not saying that your brother doesn't think that about himself. Right? Like, yeah, I have a brother. He has a God complex. Uh, no, I'm saying what would it take for you to think that your brother is the Messiah? Right? I mean, it would take quite a bit. In fact, when you read the Gospels, you'll find out that Jesus' brothers were very antagonistic towards him until the resurrection. And then they said, oh my, this, this, this brother that we grew up, I think he's God. What would it take for that to happen? And, and here's the thing that James says that's so powerful. I'm going to read it to you, then we'll explain it. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. James is looking on and saying, I lacked all this wisdom when it came to who Jesus was. After the resurrection, I saw him and realized, wow, he's the one. And I didn't even, I grew up with him, I didn't even realize it. And God gave me this wisdom to be able to see and recognize who he is. And this is one of the challenges that we have. And this is why James is saying, don't you understand? I've experienced this wisdom. You need to experience this wisdom too. And the best part is, is that God is waiting for you to ask. 
You see, one of the reasons why we fail in, 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 in asking for wisdom is, and if we're being honest, it's because we think that we're kind of supposed to know already. And so we don't ask for wisdom because we don't want anybody to think that we don't have wisdom and that becomes the thing that makes us foolish. And there, there, there's something that, that happens when we lack wisdom and it's not just that we make a bad decision, it's that we end up falling into one of these three categories and none of them are good. And all of them, I, I feel like I've been one of them um, at different points in my life and maybe as we go through this, you're like, hey man, I think I'm doing that now or maybe I was that in the past and working through that. And so uh, we're gonna talk about that. And so we started this series last week and we were calling it Hindsight and we're talking about this book in the Bible called Proverbs. Now, Proverbs is a collection of sayings, which was written, uh, which were all written by King Solomon. Now, Solomon was the king of Israel, and he was the son of David, the king, King David. You know, David and Goliath. David, that David. David dies, and then Solomon becomes king. And so, uh, he writes down all of these sayings. Uh, because it's said that Solomon was the wisest man in the world up until that time. There's some that might say that Solomon was the wisest man ever to live. Uh, we mentioned this last week as we opened the series that Jesus talked about the wisdom of Solomon. And if Jesus calls you wise, that's something to put on a college application. And so Solomon, then he, when he talks about not just wisdom that's available, but he's, he now says, what happens with the people that don't accept the wisdom that God offers to us? Where is that? And he says that people like that usually fall into one of three categories and their lives end up taking a very strange turn. And so what he does is he wants us to then understand who these people are and then most importantly, how to remedy the situation. Because I believe this, and this I think is so important for us, is that if you know wh who these three people are, these three types of people, and you say, man, this is where I am now, or I want to avoid that, and that is the most important thing. If we are there, how do I get out from being that? If that's what they are, how do I avoid that and avoid the consequences of being that and, 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 and instead embrace the blessings of wisdom? So we're going to be in uh, Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 20. So if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open there. If you have the notes that we gave you or you can open the Calvary app, um, you can do that. Or you can check Instagram and make it look like you're looking at the Calvary app. Um, but then God will know and something weird might happen. So anyway... <laughs> Beware. All right. So we're going to start in uh, chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates of the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And if you pause there and give me your attention... There's three types of people that he mentions here, and then he's going to talk about how to not be that a little bit later on. But I want to define who these three people are, right? He talks about the simple, he talks about the scorner, he talks about the fool. So let's start, number one, the simple person. The simple person lacks experience. Now here's the thing that I want you to understand, is that Solomon gives wisdom this personification that wisdom is like a woman who's on the side of the street and she's calling out to anyone who will listen. And most people just walk on by and ignore the call of wisdom. But those who are wise stop and embrace what's being offered to them. Now, the simple person is the naive person, right? The simple person is the person who hears wisdom and their response is, yeah, that's never going to happen to me. And if you're a parent and you have kids and you're trying to explain to your kids, like, hey, you don't want to do that because this is going to happen. And then your kids, because they don't have experience, they'll say, come on, that's never going to happen to me. The problem is experience would tell you otherwise. So here's what the simple person does. The simple person walks onto a college campus, right, for the first time. And they see this big sign that says free t shirt all you have to do is apply for a credit card and you get a free t-shirt. Now, a simple person has had no reaction to that. Like, oh, wow, that's nice. If you're over the age of 40, all the hair on the back of your neck is standing up. It's like you've turned into Peter Parker and your spider senses are tingling. And you're like, no, you can't do it. Why? Because you're like, why? It's just a free t-shirt. And you're like, no, no, no. That's where a lifetime of debt begins. And, and see, but the simple person says, no, no, I'm not getting into debt. 
I'm just getting a free t-shirt. And the person that's a little wiser says, that is a $25,000 t-shirt you're buying and you're gonna be paying for that until your kids go to college. And, and, and now, the, and, and here's the challenge, but it's, it's unwise. But when you don't know, you just don't know any better. And listen, being simple doesn't mean that you're dumb. Being simple just means you're inexperienced. And you don't know that you just signed up for the $20,000 t-shirt. You see, but there's something that can happen that I think is so important. Look at, uh, Solomon says this. He says, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Here's the thing that Solomon says, that being wise or being simple is like being part of a family. There are certain things that you inherit because you're part of the family. In that culture, you became king because your dad was king, right? There was no election. You inherited the crown. Solomon says that wisdom and simplicity can be the same. That through influence, through proximity, we impact those that are closest. Uh, we impact the, what's given from those that are closest to us. And if the simple push away wisdom, they will inherit foolishness. But if the simple will receive wisdom, listen, it can, wisdom can turn the simple into a king. But here's the reality. Now, if you're young and you say, well, I hate to admit it, but maybe I'm in the place of, of the simple. I don't have tons of experience. Listen, if you're young um, and, and you, it, here, here's where you are, and this is okay, it, whether you are young or you were young, we've all lived here. Okay, here's where, we, here's where we live. Where you have all the energy and all the talent and all the drive in the world, but what you lack are the guardrails of wisdom and experience to focus you. And so here's what can happen, is that you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have all the vigor and strength and energy and talent that comes from being young, and you can have the wisdom that comes from experience, but here's what you have to do. You have to recognize that you're not as wise as someone who's a little further down the road and you've got to ask for it. You've got to ask for wisdom because remember, wisdom is calling out to those who are, who are walking down the road, but wisdom is not going to chase you. You have to seek it. We're going to talk about that more in a minute, but I want to talk about the second person. He says, scorners delight in their scorning. We're going to punt that for a few minutes, but I want to talk about the third one, and that is fools hate knowledge. The foolish person, number two, lacks care. The foolish person lacks care. If the simple person is the one who says, I don't know, the foolish person is the one who just says, I don't care. The fool is the one who keeps repeating the same mistakes over and over again because they either don't remember or don't care about the consequences. In fact, here is how Solomon describes the foolish person. He says this, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Now, Vomiting, I think we can all agree, is like one of the world's worst feelings uh, in, in the world because the, the, and the reason that a person is vomiting is because the, your body is rejecting whatever it is that, that's, that's going in. But here's the challenge. A dog returns to its vomit because the dog isn't wise enough to realize that their body has already rejected the thing that they're going back to. And this is the challenge that many of us experience, is that we make a decision and it's a disaster. Everybody, that happens to everyone. We, already, we talked about that. Everybody's made at least one bad mistake. But here's where now we have a decision to make to say, will I keep doing the same thing again or am I gonna do something different? I'm gonna embrace new wisdom, new information, new understanding and change the way that I operate. You see, the dog keeps returning to its vomit because, once again, there's nothing wrong with something making you vomit. The, the challenge is the person who is a fool keeps going back to the vomit still thinking that it's going to be okay. And they just do this over and over and over again. Now, here's the cool thing that wisdom does, is that wisdom doesn't just let you make a good decision. I mean, wisdom kind of punts you so far ahead that, I mean, you're just far beyond where you could be in years, in experience. In fact, um, Solomon was the wise one who wrote all of these sayings down. David, his dad, was the poet. 
And he wrote all of these songs that were sung in the temple in worship of God. And so there's this, probably the largest book in the Bible is called the Psalms. It's right in the middle. If you ever open a Bible right in the middle, it always falls to Psalms because uh, it's so big and it's right in the middle. But here's what David writes, uh, Solomon's dad. He says, he, this is his prayer to God. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies for they, that is your commands, are my constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers for I am always thinking of your Laws. That's why not just wisdom, but God's wisdom can take us even farther than the wisdom that those who would teach us could have. When, when my kids, uh, a few years ago, when my kids were taking karate, one day there was this guest uh, sensei, and uh, the kids were doing some sparring. But you know what happens when kids spar is that they're just, you know, punching or kicking, whatever, and they're not really going for it. And so this guest sensei was like, no, 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 you really got to try to punch. So he decides that he's going to show, like, if you got you got to learn how to block full force. So he picks someone as an example, and he decides to pick my daughter, Mia. And uh, my, Mia was probably about eight or nine at the time. And so he says to Mia, he says, Mia, I want you to punch me in the face. And Mia says, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to hit people in the face. And uh, which I thought was great. Like sometimes you wonder if parenting is really working. And it's like, that was one thing. Hey, it landed. Um, so anyway, the, the sensei guy says, no, Mia, I'm the teacher. I'm a black belt. I want you to punch me in the face. So she says, okay. So Mia throws a punch and stops about two inches from, from his face. And, and the guy's like, no, I want you to punch me in the face. She says, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to hit people in the face. So he tells Mia to sit down. Mia's cousin, Carrie, who's a year younger, she's about seven, eight at the time, and he says to her, okay, what's your name, blonde girl? And uh, she says, Carrie. He says, Carrie, I want you to come stand, and I want you to punch me in the face. And before he can even get the sentence out, my, my niece, Carrie, goes, boom, <laughs> and punches him square in the face. And the guy goes kind of stumbling back. I mean, if you remember the first fight in Rocky Three between Rocky and Clubber Lang, you're like, there is no tomorrow. Anyway, I have a lot of that movie memorized. And so anyway, if you go into that, right, uh, there's the part where, you know, Rocky stumbles. That's what it looked like. I mean, the guy was just like really stumbling and, and whatnot. And then uh, the guy's visibly stunned. And, uh, and what the weird part is, is that he's demanding for all these kids to punch him. Someone finally does, and then all the parents started clapping. <laughs> it was a really bizarre moment in my life that uh, parents just clapping over that. And then, and the sensei, he, he's just like, okay, uh, let's move on to something else, <laughs> right? And that's what happens, right? Is that wisdom has the ability to make you smarter than your teachers. Wisdom has the ability to keep you from getting punched in the face over and over again because that's what the fool does. The fool uh, just keeps making the same decisions, right? We just keep dating the same person, same type of person over and over, expecting things to be different, but it's not. We keep spending money the same way, thinking that it's going to be different, but it's not. We keep using these destructive words with the people that we love, and we wonder why everything around us is damaged. Listen, the lie that we keep believing when we're the fool is that somehow the consequences aren't going to happen to us. The scoffer is a little bit different, and that's why I switched them, because the scoffer is the fool. He's just the fool on steroids. Because the scoffer is not just the one who lacks care. The, the scoffer is the person who lacks humility on top of it. You see, the scoffer is the fool who always thinks he's right. He's the fool who's always condescending and mocks those who do something different. In fact, you want to know how bad the situation is with scoffers? Uh, this is what Solomon writes in chapter 17. He says, he who begets a scoffer, that is a fancy um, old English word, which means to give birth to. He who gives birth to or begets a scoffer does so to his own sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. He says, this is, Solomon says, this is how bad it is uh, when you're a scoffer. Even your parents don't like you. Because the scoffer even makes their parents' lives miserable. Because think about what parents are trying to do. Parents are trying to give correction. And I get it. And I'm a parent. And sometimes we can be a little bit much and all that. And, and, but, but, but follow me here. I have never met a parent in all of my days who has said this. Who has said, you know what I'm really hoping for my kids? I'm hoping that my kids are just a little less successful than me. 
you know, I just want to be a little more successful so they always, no. No parent has ever said that. Here's what every parent says. I want my kids to stand on my shoulders so that they far exceed anything that I've ever been able to do or accomplish in life. That we want the absolute best. The scoffer can't even see that with their parents and the people that love them most because everything is an attack. The scoffer brings problems and destroys everything that they touch. In fact, listen to how in such really poetic language, I love how Solomon puts it. He says, scoffers set a city aflame, but a wise man turns away wrath. You see, correct the simple, they might not get you. Correct the fool, they might ignore you. Correct a scoffer and they might ridicule you, but when you correct a wise person, they will thank you. That's why at the end of the chapter, in verses 32 and 33, I put it in your notes. It says this, it says, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will harm them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. So how do we get there? How do you go from, how do you avoid from being the simple or the scoffer or the fool or if we are, how do we stop being that? There's three things that I want to tell you as we close. Here's the first one, if you're a note taker. And that is that I need to make a decision to seek wisdom. Make a decision to seek wisdom. In, in Proverbs 4, here's what Solomon says. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Once again, Sol Solomon is personifying wisdom as this woman who's standing on the side of the road calling out, looking to see if someone will slow down and grab hold of the wisdom that's being taught. And what happens is most just keep, they just keep walking by. You see, we need to seek out wisdom. Think about that, though it costs you all you have, that there is no price limit when it comes to getting wisdom. We, I mean, if, imagine if we sought out wisdom with the same intensity that we sought out a late night snack. <laughs> think about the level of intensity that you use to seek out a late night snack. I mean, think about what you do, right? Everybody's asleep, but for some reason you can't sleep. And so you wake up, or you get up, and you go to the fridge, and you open the fridge up. There's nothing there. And you knew that before you even opened it. But you were just hoping something was gonna happen. So you close it, and then you walk around, you open, cupboards and you open the pantry and you're just hoping there's nothing. So you know what you do? You go back to the fridge. You open up the fridge again and you're like, maybe I missed something. And you're like, it's just all condiments, you know, and, you're, and mayonnaise, you know, whatever. And you're looking, there's nothing there. And then you know what you do? You close it up. And then you open up the oven, hoping like maybe someone left a pizza. And uh, you open up the microwave. Maybe someone stashed a donut or something in there and you close it. And then you know what you do? This is so crazy. You know what you do? You go back to the fridge. And then you think, I found it. I found salsa. But it wasn't salsa. It's a tomato that's going bad. But you saw it through a storage container. And it had like this half an onion thing. And you thought that it was just a reflection. There was nothing there. And this is the challenge, right? Is that if we would seek wisdom that hard, you know what would happen? We'd find it. In, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet. And Jeremiah was calling the people of Israel. Uh, this is now about 600 BC. The people of Israel had really stopped following God and they had kind of gone their own way. And life was miserable for them. And in fact, so miserable that they were being conquered by the world power at that time, which was the Babylonian Empire. And so Jeremiah was telling them, this is gonna happen. And they were like, hey, can you just tell us what we wanna hear? And he's like, here's what you, here's the reality. Babylon's coming, they're gonna take over, but things are going to get better afterwards because this whole experience is going to cure you of all this other seeking and ignoring God and all this. This is the circumstance is going to change you. And here's what, here's what he, he says to them, right? This is God speaking through the prophet. Here's what he says. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That means that we do everything possible to not just find wisdom, but find God's wisdom that's timeless, that can change the trajectory of our future. You see, I, I remember when I was, uh, I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did not grow up as a Christian. I became a Christian at, uh, right when I was starting college. I was 19, and I had zero understanding of the Bible. 
And so I remember, um, I, I remember reading, because I didn't know anything, none of it made sense, so I remember, because I had seen the movie, I read the first part of Exodus, because I had seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston when I was a kid. And so I read that, and I'm like, oh, that sounds familiar. And then I just started flipping through, and I found this book uh, called Job. But I thought, I didn't know it was Job, I thought it was Job. And so I thought it was like the classified ads of the Bible, that I'm like, oh, this must be like all the positions that are available uh, to create. Like, I had no idea what was going on. And so, um, but I remember going, I started attending a great church, and but, you know, once again, this is before the internet and, like, electricity and all of that. So, you know, we're going by horse, horseless carriage, and by candlelight. And so, anyway, I remember getting to church just on a random night. We're like, hey, is anything going on? And I remember getting to the door, and guy opens, a uh, person opens the door, and, and, and I'm like, hey, is, is there something going on? And they're like, yeah, there's, there's a Bible study uh, uh, for, for women over the age of 50. That's the only thing going on. Um, and I was like, that's cool, I'll hang out. And I sat in the back, learned a lot. And, uh, and, here's, and here's the point, right? Is that um, we don't find wisdom when we take a casual approach to it. So we've got to seek wisdom as though that it's, it, it, it's the next breath that we take. Here's the second one, and this is hard, all right? The second one is this. Learn to say, I don't know. Learn to say, I don't know. There's no way around this. Here's what Solomon says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. If you want to be wise, you've got to learn to say that you don't know. And one of the reasons that we don't say, we, I don't know, is because we want to hide our lack of wisdom. But listen, you can't get wise and have your image all at the same time. You, you're going to have to care more about wisdom than, uh, than about your, your, your image. But you know what happens, and guys, let me just tell you how we do it. And, and I'm, I don't know if ladies do this. I have no idea, but I know guys do this. All right. We take our car, car's making a, making a weird noise um, or it's not working. We take it to a repair shop. And then the guy comes out, right? And it's the guy, he's got like the uniform and he's got like some rag and he's cleaning off his hands. He's like, all right, I took a look at the car. And, uh, and then he starts talking a language using words. We have no idea. And so he starts talking about spark plugs and fuel systems and the flux capacitor and all this. And, uh -huh, yeah. and you know what we do as guys? We're, we're like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that too. I just come in here for second opinion. And uh, that's what I, that's what I, th like, no, you didn't know. But that's, that's what, because if you knew what all that stuff was, you'd be able to fix it yourself. In fact, if someone were to have told us, hey, where's the spare tire? And your car, I mean, this would take a couple of minutes. Like, I think it's, I mean, I look, it's not in the trunk, because I, I looked, and maybe, I don't know. It's not on the roof. I've, I've been there. But, and, and we're, like, honestly, it would take us a couple of minutes. And, and here's the point. It's only when you humble yourself to say, hey, I don't know everything, but I want to know more. Listen, that will set you free when you just, like, you don't have to appear like you know everything. It's going to set you free and position you in a place to gain wisdom. Here's the last thing. This one's hard. That's why I saved it for last. Learn to say, I was wrong. Here's what Solomon writes. He says, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. You see, being able to say, I was wrong, takes a level of humility that you say, I care more about the relationship than I do about being right. I care more about the relationship than I do about appearing like um, something. And let me tell you how this works practically. In marriage, so often there's so much conflict simply because of pride. People are miserable because of pride in, 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 in marriage, that neither party will humble themselves that I can't be wrong and it's always their fault and now it's like, you know, we've been married and divorced six times but it's always somebody else's issue. Listen, here's what humility does. Humility says, I'm owning my weaknesses and I'm taking responsibility. I'm recognizing that I'm not perfect, I need to grow and I need God's help. A lot of times people, couples, they won't go to counseling because they're like, oh, I don't need that. We can, we can, we fix everything here in-house. Well, how's it going? Horrible. But, you know, so, well, then apparently it's not getting fixed in-house. But listen, you got to call it what it is. 
It's pride. And here's the bad news. The Bible says that same James, and he knew it, he lived it. James, who didn't believe and who, you know, was, you know, very critical of Jesus until after the resurrection, he says this, God opposes proud people, but he gives grace to people who are humble. You see, singles, a lot of times, here's what happens is that we, we don't, we, we, we're not married and sometimes it's because of pride and that we just won't accept the wisdom of, hey, maybe I don't know everything. And so we take a relationship only so far and then we just hit the nuke button, blow it up and then say, well, that one didn't work and not realizing that there's a pattern here. Listen, career-wise, it happens the same way. We're stuck because we, we can't seem like there's anything for us to learn that we know best. Listen, humble people just don't assume that they know everything. They ask questions, you know what happens? They go farther. Now, we're in church, so let's talk about our relationship with God. And that you know that so many times we aren't growing and it's because of pride. That we won't submit to God and the thing he's asked us to do, and here's why. Because we think, no, God, you understand, I've got a special situation. That works for everybody else except for me. And you know what that is? Pride. That we just think we know better. That's not wisdom. Now we're in the place of the fool or the scoffer. You see, if we were to take a look at our lives and look at past mistakes, not for the sake of beating ourselves up, but for the sake of seeking and saying, is there a pattern here? You know what we'd find? But sometimes when it comes to the words that we say or the attitudes that we take or some of the decisions that we make with money or some of the decisions that we make in relationships and some of the choices that we make when it comes to how we want life to progress for us, you know what we would find if we would realize some of the things that we've, that we've done to say, man, have I been simple? Have I been the scoffer? Have I been, have I been the fool? You know what would happen? We could actually recognize there's a pattern here to some of these mistakes. And we could now receive God's wisdom who, according to James, just offers it for us if we want to take it. And that would put us on a brand new path to not repeat those mistakes that we've made in the past in our present or certainly not in our future. Because what God wants to do is give us, our, give us his wisdom so that we, it can put us on a brand new trajectory and here's the cool part is that what we read and we opened is that if we will ask him for wisdom, he will give it to us. But we're going to have to seek him to get it. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for offering wisdom to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would have the humility to seek it, to take it, to embrace it, and for you to do a great work in us and through us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. Make sure to click the subscribe button below to stay up to date with all the things happening here at Calvary. God bless you.